Calicordus, it's the Mariposa lilies, and just the part, if I start kind of lapsing into Latin, most of my botanical experience has is, is been through Latin names, and I try to put common names with all sorts of things, uh, just because I know there's people out there that don't get the common name, or the, the Latin names that well. Uh, so most of my pictures are all going to have both. So these are the kind of very showy plants. In California, they're probably one of the most favorite, they're one of the, one of the most favorite, yeah, pardon me, get my back here, here. One of California's favorite plants to run into out in the wild. Normally at this point in the program, I'd ask how many of you have seen Calicordus delays and how many of you think it's one of your favorite flowers, but that's a little harder to do over a Zoom program. You find them occasional, just as individuals scattered around, usually they're bright color, cross the eyes to them. Uh, splotch of yellow here, a splotch of white there, uh, magenta, or even purple. And if you happen to have the opportunity to go after a visit a slope after it's burned, uh, the Mariposa lilies can be all over that slope and can be just absolutely spectacular. This particular spot here, this is Catalina Mariposa lily in a patch after uh, fire in 2007. And a typical patch of Mariposa lilies we were finding in this fire area was around 2,000 individuals, and which can be pretty spectacular. And in these areas where they haven't burned yet, you often only can find a handful of individuals. We'll find them in most habitats. We'll find them in, in woodlands and uh, uh, chaparral, coastal sage, but usually more open habitat. In other, generally, you don't see them under the tree in Southern California. And they extend all the way from the, from the uh, uh, coast up into the mountains. Now this program I'm doing here tonight actually focuses mostly on the southwestern species in California. So not really focusing on the desert species. In Southern California, it's, the Liliaceae is pretty, pretty simple to work with. We basically have three different genera down here that you have to learn them. One of them is the true lilies, which are often very large flowered, or humble tiger lily down here, for example, generally stands about seven or eight feet tall with an orange flower that's bigger than a fist. And they are tend to be late spring and summer bloomers. Lemon lily is our other prominent species. We don't have a whole lot of true lilies in Southern California, just three actually. And then there's Fritillaria, which we know down mostly as chocolate lilies down here. Turns out we, it, it's a much bigger genus than just our chocolate lily. But um, they're often sort of a brown or, or sort of a uh, uh, more earthy colored type plant down in Southern California. There are mountain areas or found in clay and such. The petal arrangements on all these are very different. And those that both the lilies and the fritillaries usually have six uh, Tepals, I guess they call it tepals, are kind of like somewhere across between a petal and a sepal. But if you look at cal the uh, calcordus, that's the mariposa lilies, they're, they're actually differentiated. You've got three that look like real sepals and you've got three that look like petals. And calcordus, of course, being on the right. Kind of a fun slide. I did a little work with geography now that Florida North America is out and uh, you can use some of the guides to Mexico and kind of figure out where all these mariposa lilies are. There's about 42 species or so. I mean, most of actually there's 42 species in California. Yeah, about 70 species across the Western United States. And I forgot how I many were actually in Mexico. But this map gives you a feeling for where most of the mariposa lilies are found. You can find them as far south as Guatemala and as far north as British Columbia. They barely get into British Columbia. They barely get into North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska. Just one species gets up into those areas. As you go towards California, the numbers gradually increase. And of course, California has 42 species of Mariposa lilies. They keep you quite busy trying to see all those. Oregon comes in next with 17 species. A lot of the areas in the states in Mexico are quite small. So it's a little bit of a uh, uh, misleading when you have these lower numbers down there. If we had areas, states about the same size as California, you'd end up with a lot more species. But it is no doubt that California is the center of distribution for this particular plant. So we're very, very lucky in that. There's quite a diversity in California, and we have a reasonable, we have about half of them in Southern California. And here's some uh, examples of, of the different 
colors and forms that you get uh, with, with uh, mariposa lilies. The way I've broken this program down is to go through the different sections of mariposa lilies. There's three sections in California. And the first section we approach is section calicordis. There's only one species in Southern California, so it's a pretty easy group to, to learn. And it's also a very distinctive flower. That's Calicordus albus, uh, fairy lantern, which is, or sometimes called fairy, or, uh, globe flower. It has a sort of rounded shaped overall flower. If you cut it open, you can see on the, on the photo on the right that it's, it's a, uh, uh, basically uh, lots of hairs on the inner surface of the petals. You can see the anthers, you can see the, or the, uh, the style and such there, but it's kind of a neat little plant. Ours are pretty much white in Southern California. I understand other parts of the state, this can actually get a little bit more pinkish colored, but as far as I've ever seen, it's only white. We do find it in, in a, a little bit higher elevations. We don't really find it in the little coastal areas in most of Southern California. So the mountain foothills and such, uh, woodlands, frequently found after a fire. It's got a very distinctive fruit, which is sort of a standout compared to all the other calicordists in Southern California. And we call it sort of a winged fruit with a cross section at the top in yellow. You can see that it's, you know, all the, all the, all the fruits in Mariposa lilies are, are three parted. And this one has got these little wings coming off all three. You can see on the left, I've got distribution maps for these that uh, you can see that it's fairly widespread in Southern California, but not necessarily in, in high numbers. And there it is largely associated with higher elevations. It does extend farther north into, into Central and Northern California. There's other species of, in that group in Northern California and some are even yellow, it's kind of neat. The second group we're gonna look at here is section mariposa. This is the largest group in Southern California. There are 12 species with three additional varieties in Southern California. And it's also the one that's a little harder to try to sort the species out because they start looking a little bit uh, similar to each other in some cases. This particular uh, group is often characterized by a, a bulb that has uh, basically a smooth bulb and often has bulblets at the base of the the flower or the base of the plant. And for those who been asked earlier about it, these calicordises, it they all have a leaf-like uh, or a grass-like leaf on them. And that's what they've been photosynthesized earlier in the season and build up uh, nutrients in their corn in their bulb. And then the bulb, that's what kind of keeps going, that keeps dumping nutrients into the plant, develops the flower and the the uh, fruit. The first one we'll look at in the section Mariposa is the Catalina Mariposa lily. This is something you should be familiar with up in Santa Barbara County. I believe we've got it up as far north as San Luis Obispo. And it's certainly common in the uh, Santa Monica Mountains and the foothills of the Santa Ana Mountains in Orange County. As far as we know, it doesn't occur as far south as San Diego. Basically, it's a white flowered Mariposa lily with a relatively dark uh, central patch at the base of the petal sort of a maroon color with yellow hairs. And in this case, you can see it's sort of a pinkish, pinkish to bluish colored uh, stamens. On the outside you can see of the flower, you see sort of a dark patch at the base. It's kind of, it's, you're basically seeing the, the patch from two different sides there. There's the fruit. It's another one with a very distinctive fruit. It has sort of a barrel shaped fruit. For those that do uh, plant surveys, it's kind of nice because the fruit lasts lo longer than the flower does. And so you can actually survey for this plant into almost into the early summer, whereas many other calicordists, you only have a fairly narrow window to survey. You frequently find it in, in native grasslands, very common habitat for it. You'll find it in coastal sage and chaparral, but almost always in some sort of a, um, an opening in uh, those two habitats. So from the map, you can see this is essentially an Orange County, Western Riverside County plant that occurs uh, into Santa Barbara here and on some of the Channel Islands. We're not actually sure about the Riverside County collection. There's only two records and uh, I haven't had a chance to examine them. Hang on, one of my wine straight cats is walking over the keyboard here. Okay, hang on, that was Chianti. 
Matt, you can see that, sorry. Anyway, so the Riverside County collection, we're a little dubious of, there are two collections and at the San Bernardino, uh, uh, is it State University? Uh, herbarium, and they actually lost track of the specimens. So they were trying to hunt them down. This plant's interesting because uh, after a fire, you really get large numbers of it. We did a survey at the Foothills of Santa Ana Mountains in 2008, and the uh, uh, previous, before the surveys, before the fire, you often would find something like maybe 100 individuals, and we were finding thousands at a time. By the time we got done, we found 60,000 individual plants. So that was pretty impressive. Just to say, I got a lot of Calcordus Catalina pictures. This looks pretty similar. This is this is Dunn's Mariposa. Hang on here. I gotta get some thing. I did my relying a little bit on my uh, common names up there, and they're buried underneath the, uh, uh, the the pictures of people there. I got that out of the way. So Dunn's Mariposa lily. It's a smaller flower than you'd find in Cal Cal Catalina Mariposa lily, and. Uh, it has, again, dark patches at the base of the petal, but it's almost more of a chevron shape. You can see to that, where it's got sort of a dark outer section, and then it's got a yellow base to it. And if you're actually seeing is the yellow hairs coming through the, the petal. If you look at the picture on the right, you can see that they're actually yellow. This is a soil specialist found on gabbro soils and most frequently seen following fire. It's also one of the uh, CMPS rare plants. Hang on here. Oh, there we go. For some reason my uh, thing wasn't shifting to the next picture. So, but Dunn's Mariposa lily is also a very narrowly distributed plant. If you look at the map there, you can see it's basically a San Diego County endemic. And it's found places like the San Ysidro Mountains, Otay Mountain, Guate Mountain, and parts of the uh, Cuyamaca Mountains. The habitat is typically openings in chaparral or burned areas. And in a burned area, like the picture that's down below on the left, you can see there's quite a few uh, lilies there uh, amongst all the, the burnt shrubs. The fruit is relatively wide. A lot of the uh, members of this particular group of, of mariposa lilies often have fruits that are narrow at the top and they get broader at the bottom. The fruits are not necessarily, for most plants, very a very good identifying character because they have a lot of overlap and shape, and there's not a lot of distinctiveness to it. It's very fortunate that the flowers are are so different in this group. And here's the here's the uh, uh, shy mariposa lily. We're not quite sure why they call it shy. Maybe because it's sort of uh, not as colorful as some of the other ones. Maybe the people that originally got found it were having a hard time finding it, considered it sort of shy. It's pretty much a mountain species. I would say it's a little on the delicate looking side. It's often white with uh, yellow hairs at the base. And the most distinctive character about it is seen in this photo on the, the left is that it has, essentially has like a green racing stripe down the outside of the, of the petal. That's very nice for character for identification because it's the only one that does that. There are a couple of other species that live up in the same habitat as this one. And it's always nice to have at least one standout character that really helps out. So you find this one growing in like the, the meadows and such here to the Laguna Mountains or up at like last weekend, I was seeing it up at the top of the Santa Rosa Mountains in a more arid habitat. Uh, it's very common in the San Bernardino Mountains and uh, you'll find it in the higher transverse ranges. Again, notice that the fruit on this is, is, is narrow at the tip and relatively fat at the base. There's just a little tiny patch of this stuff growing at the top of the St. Anna Mountains in Orange County, so we just barely have it in that area. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated because we're starting to get some of the species where the characteristic flower color may not be the color that the flower actually is all the time. For example, here we see that on the, in the upper left, that's a pretty typical shy mariposa lily flower. I think most of the flowers you'll see, 90% of them, will probably be just white with the, the uh, yellow anthers and sort of blue 
I'm sorry, the yellow hairs and the blue anthers. But in some areas, they start picking up other color. So the one at the upper uh, right, for example, there we've got a little bit of a, a purplish cast to it, and it almost seems to have white stripes down in the middle of the uh, uh, petals. And then down below, you can see it can get quite extreme sometimes. It actually can become purple. And one of those purple flowers, the one on the, the left, is actually from the Laguna Mountains in San Diego County, and the one from the right is from the San Bernardino Mountains. But you don't see that a lot. It's just here and there, you, once in a while, you'll find ones with different colors on it. This is actually the best time of year for finding this plant. It's just one of those, sorry. It's one of those things where apparently I'm on this program and the cats are now being very entertaining and getting into trouble. Okay. One of them was just about to slip out the door there on me. Okay. So here's another flower that's typically white and it's a mountain species. This is the Palmer's Mariposillae. There's actually two of them. We'll start with the, the, the uh, more typical form, which is uh, Calcordus palmeri variation palmeri. It has a relatively small flower. It often is spread almost flat, so not really forming a bowl as much, uh, much more open. It's got sort of a dramatic uh, center section where it's got yellow nectaries with hairs on it and sort of a red margin on it. And if you look now, you can see the sepals on that flower on the right, and it's actually got a fair amount of color on the sepal itself, somewhat similar to what you're seeing the flowers who are mimicking it. What's unusual about this calcord is, is that it's found in basically wet ground. Uh, most of our calcordas are very, cl very clearly upland species and this one basically likes mountain meadows and so you find it along stream courses and in almost wet meadows uh, like in the San Bernardino Mountains and such. There's a map showing there's a growing in habitat there. Basically it's growing with carex and uh, various wet grasses almost here. The one we're talking about here is the one on a map that's showing up in green. So basically from the transverse mountains, I guess one little population in the, uh, hang on here. Okay. There's a uh, uh, one in the uh, San Jacinto Mountains, and most of them are in the transverse mountains. And you've got them in Santa Barbara County and Inland Ventura. But there's actually two of them. The other one is Calcordus palmeri variation mungii, Munzas mariposa lily. And this one's very different in some ways than the other. They're, uh, for the most part, the way they're put together is there's morphological structure is very similar. That's why they're considered the same species. But this one tends to form a little bit more of a cup. It doesn't have quite as distinct a pattern with the uh, around the nectaries at the base of the petals. You've still basically got yellow flower or yellow hairs on it and they have sort of a club shape on them. But this is a dry wet or a dry upland species versus the other one being a wetland species. Now the interesting thing about Munza's primary lily is that for most of tradition, most of time, and then including in it, you'll find it even in the 2012 Jepson manual, I believe it's this way, it's just considered a Riverside County endemic. If you look at this uh, map here, we're looking at the red, that upper splotch there, that's the San Juan Center Mountains. Basically, when Owen B. did his studies back in the 1940s, that was the only place they ever found this plant. And uh, then John Redman, who runs the herbarium down at the San Diego Natural History Museum, found some plants in Baja California, possibly even, I believe, that the lowest red dot on the map that when we looked at these things, it looked a lot like uh, Munza's Mariposa lily, but it's way out of range compared to what it's supposed to be. Well, I we went back and looked at the specimens and John realized that there was a bunch of these things in Mexico. And in fact, there were even a couple in San Diego County. And so what we found out was uh, that Munza's Mariposa lily is not a Riverside County endemic, that in fact it occurs from uh, the San Jacinto Mountain South uh, almost to Punta Banda in the interior of Baja California. But most of the records are pretty old for the United States out this, this area. I managed to find some uh, last year, finally, late San Diego County. I spent seven years looking for this stuff more recently, and it's not been easy to find. So the photograph 
you see at the right there is Bear is a population at Bear Valley in, in um, southeastern San Diego County, and basically growing in kind of like openings in coast in uh, Great Basin scrub. Kind of interesting. This one's really a Central Californian species, a superb mariposa lily. It's uh, easiest to, to identify by the, the sort of arrowhead shaped uh, pattern on the nectaries at the base of the petal. It also has one large spot on the petal, uh, which you can see in these photographs in both sides. It's so scarce in Southern California that for a long, long time, we knew of it only occurring in one meadow in the Mount Palomar area in Northern San Diego County. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was reported that someone found it up in the western end of the San Bernardino Mountains, but I haven't seen any specimens for it yet. These, except for these two locations, the southernmost location would actually have been, in the, I believe it's in the San Rafael Mountains or, or Figueroa Mountain in Santa Barbara County. So it's really more of a Sierra Nevada species than a Southern California one. It's kind of nice that it's, it's here. Uh, very few people get to see it because as you can see, there's this nice big fence around the meadow. I was working with, and some of you may know Mark Elvin up at the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the Ventura office. Uh, he was brave enough to just go ask the landowner if we could go uh, look at the plants, and they said yes, as long as we didn't report them to anybody and, as an endangered species or something. We didn't, I don't think we told them that Mark was actually in the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so they let us out. We got photographs of it, but it's been very, very difficult for people to come out and take a look at this plant, Brett. This is our most widespread mariposa lily in Southern California, the splendid mariposa lily, Calicordis splendens. It's usually characterized by having sort of a, a pale lavender or pinkish, pale pinkish colored uh, flower, although it can be pretty richly, you know, almost a more of a rich lavender or a magenta color occasionally. It has white hairs. Now, if you remember that picture I showed you earlier about Munz's mariposa lily, that had yellow hairs. That's, that was the key reason why we were able to separate these things. A lot of mariposa, uh, Munz's mariposa lilies were, that had been collected were masquerading as splendid mariposa lily. But if you looked at the specimens, you realized they had yellow hair, so it was not splendid. It has a dark center at the base of the petal, and that, uh, but that sometimes seems to be lacking. It's a pretty nondescript lily overall, but of course it's very pretty when you see hundreds of them at the same time. And I was quite curious to find out that it doesn't behave the same way in all parts of California. Here's our distribution map on this. You can see that in Southern California, this is really is the most widespread of the lilies. It probably even widespread over the LA basin, except for how much of that area had all been converted into development by the time people were we're really looking at this thing. So I suspect it was even more widespread there. And then you know, where you guys are, it seems like it's more of an interior species than an actual coastal species. I haven't worked up in Santa Barbara County in the coast enough lately to know if, if it's actually a bit more widespread. But if you look at the collections, it tends to show that there's, it's not as common on the immediate coast. It is corralled on San Catalina Island also. So this lily also has a little interesting story. I was going to point out on it here. Here's another typical fruit for many uh, shape for many mariposa lilies. Just basically a linear fruit. Nothing special about it. Uh, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller. Uh, tapered at both ends. That's pretty common. In the photograph below showing the habitat, what I've uh, selected here is actually a post-fire habitat, showing that again mariposa lilies can be quite abundant after you've had a burn. So here's the interesting thing about our common sort of dull and mundane splendid mariposa lily. There may actually be two lilies. The ones that we have down here in Southern California, are like the one I showed you in the little introduction to this lily, are pretty classically sort of a pink colored and they've got relatively short hairs near the base of the, the petals. And um, so if you've been doing all your stuff down here, they all look like this. But if you go to Central California, and Santa Barbara County, including, it's very different in my perspective. That's the, the plant that's shot on the left here was actually from Santa Barbara County. And if you look at this one, it still has the dark um, hairs at the base of the uh, petals, but they're totally obscured by these very, very long uh, hairs on it, very tangled. And there's another thing that's really interesting to me these too. In Southern California, the Southern form is very, very common and widespread. 
But when I went to Central California several times looking, it's actually pretty hard to find Splendid's up north. Well, what's going on is, and it's the only book that actually recognizes a book called The uh, Flora, Illustrated Floor of the Pacific States by Leroy Abrams. He actually has this other species called Calcarus davidsonianus uh, listed for Southern California. It's Hypocaldias of San Onofre Mountains, which are in Camp Pendleton in San Diego County. And that's what we've got in Orange, Riverside, in San Diego County, and parts of San Bernardino County. Uh, and I believe in the, uh, when you're also looking at the uh, Santa Monica Mountains and Palos Verdes Peninsula, whereas the typical Splendens is farther north. And if you looked at the, is it, oh, I forgot this, the Parsons and Kirstensen, I forgot that the, about 10 years ago, there was a uh, book published on Cal Cordes, and they specifically mentioned that there appears to be some genetic foundation for this. And in fact, we actually may be looking at two different species. But I've known about this issue for 15, 20 years, and no one's really addressed it yet. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting little deal that there were actually our most common reproducibility might actually be two. And you know, if you're in Northern California, you see it on one side, if you're in Southern California, you see it in the other. And don't think about the fact that they're probably two different species. There's that close up of the the petals again. You can see the David Sonianus form. The hairs are almost invisible in this photograph. Very short, very clean looking. And if you look at the other one, the hairs are just all over the place like cobwebs pretty much. Yeah, it seems like they should at least be different subspecies or different uh, varieties at the very least. I just tossed this one in. This is really hardly one of the lilies that, that, that gets into the uh, southwestern California area. This is Alkali Mariposa lilies. It's really mostly abundant in the area around Palmdale and Lancaster in the Mojave Desert and the Antelope Valley area. A little bit uh, in some of the higher elevations area areas of San Bernardino County. The reason it's in this little list though is because there's a couple records for it at a place called Whiskey Springs on the north side of the San Bernardino Mountains. And it's clearly not desert there. So it kind of still falls into our area even though it's really a desert lily. Here we go. So now as we move, if it's so on Santa Barbara County though, one of the more common species is, is butterfly mariposa lily. Kind of interesting play on words because butterfly in English and then it's Spanish is butterfly. So it's kind of a butterfly, butterfly lily. This is found largely from the Los Angeles area uh, north down to I think actually north of San Francisco and it's one of the more abundant lilies in the central parts of the state. Usually characterized by, uh, well I think most of them are white petals and it has two spots. If you look at the plant you'll see that there's one at the base near the base of the petal just above the nectary and then there's another larger blotch at the upper end of the petal. That's pretty characteristic of the species. It gets a little crazy sometimes from flower color. It doesn't always behave in that. And it makes sure you can see the picture on the, on the left. You can see the, the, the two, two blotches also. They're a little different looking on the outside. They're always more bold on the inside. Now there's an extra set of spots you see on that photo on the right. That is that the sepal itself also has a pattern on it. And it, the sepal is sort of sticking through gaps in the petals there. And that's why you see these extra three somewhat linear shaped splotches in there. Typical habitat for butterfly mariposa lily, the interior chaparral, this is in the uh, uh, Sespe Wilderness area in Ventura County. Uh, and there's plants in that photograph. You can't really see them very well. And you can see from the map that this species really is an LA County North species. It's quite thick. I believe it's also in the foothills of the Sierras. I don't necessarily always know my mariposa lilies in Northern California. Just trying to keep track of the Southern ones are sometimes interesting. This is another variable species. And I have this one particular painting I did many years ago for this. Uh, my wife Carol and I had gone to a place called Ed Davis Park in Los Angeles County. And all these forms of this plant were growing on one hillside, less than an acre uh, in size. It was quite dramatic. Unfortunately, it's before I had digital cameras, so I did not take many pictures, but we had white ones, pink ones, purple ones, red ones. It was just an absolute delight for someone who had never seen this lily before. It 
it has some really unusual variations. And uh, there's a few places in Southern California where we actually get this flower in uh, red and wine red and almost purple. And what's really kind of strange about these plants when they're like that is that they, they the dual patch sort of disappears. So on the full flower photo you see here, there is no patch visible. Of course, this is probably one of the most spectacular colored uh, Venustas you can actually find when it looks like that. And what's interesting about this form is that the backside of the petals are often white. So you've got this real contrast. We've got this really bold, beautiful red on the inside, and it's just white on the outside. Now on the outside, though, you can see there's the two patches again. We've got a, an upper and lower patch there. This is one of the plants that's interesting enough, I've noticed that on iNaturalist and a couple of the sources, people are really hesitant to let people know where these red flower ones are. They're kind of concerned that someone's gonna come by and take them all. And then perhaps that's actually something to be worried about. So desert mariposa lily, this is actually one of my favorites. I've actually found I got it on one of my t-shirts anyway. Uh, it's a bold orange flower uh, in the coastal areas. And, and that's the thing that's kind of neat about this particular plant. Although it's fairly common in, the, in uh, the mountains of the Mojave Desert, it actually does extend into the southwestern California floristic province. Uh, for the most part, it, it gets into the Ventura County area, like the Lockwood Valley, for example, but you also find it growing in the transmontane zones of the San Bernardino Mountains. And it just, it's completely unmistakable with this just absolutely bold red. It's usually a relatively short plant, and the flower can be very much like a cup in shape. And notice that nice, bold, almost black, it's really a purple colored um, nectary at the base of the petal, and the anthers are very darkly colored. It's another one that has a little bit of a club shape um, hair on the inner side of this petal, and you can see those pretty easily, but you're not gonna mistake it with anything else. There is a form in the desert the Mojave that's actually more of a pale yellow color, but there's a lot of debate whether it's really a separate subspecies or not. Here's where we, where our uh, desert mariposa lily occurs in southwestern California. Again, you can see it's sneaking off into the Mojave Desert, but there we've got it in interior Los Angeles, uh, getting into the coastal zone and uh, San Bernardino and Ventura County. There's some habitat down below, typically open uh, pinion pine, forest is a pretty good place to find it. We get into some of our yellow forms. The yellow lilies are a little tricky in this group because uh, superficially they all look about the same, which makes it a little challenging sometimes for people to sort them out if they're not used to dealing with them. This is golden bowl mariposa lily, Calicordus concolor, and it's it's the southernmost of these these this group. Uh, and there's a couple things that usually stand out on it. One, it has very large flowers compared to many of the species. They're often pretty crisp and clear, except for they'll have like a ring of, of purplish, reddish, brown color along the base of it there, and very long yellow hairs. But the hairs are straight, and they, they aren't, uh, they don't have any particular uh, swelling or anything on it. You can see this one from the outside there. You can see the base, the shape of the actual color comes through on the flower. So this one is found pretty much from the, the uh, foothills, the southern foothills of the San Bernardino Mountains, uh, around the San Jacinto Mountains, and then south into San Diego County and, and parts of northern, north, northwestern Baja, California. And it typically occurs in the sort of arid desert chaparral transition areas. This photograph here is habitat where it occurs in the McCain Valley in San Diego County, kind of on the very east edge of that, that uh, uh, orange polygon right down there next to the Mexican Imperial and in the Imperial County border. It's also a bit, blooms a bit later than some of the mariposa lilies. Most of the lilies are blooming pretty nicely in April and May. This one is just starting to bloom in May in some places, but really June and July are, are where you often see it the most. So, okay, you glance at this one and, you know, super again, as I said, it's kind of superficially, club here mariposa lily can look a lot like uh, the uh, yeah, Calicordus concolor. You've already forgotten the common name on that other one. The, uh, they both can have very similar yellow. This is typically a smaller flower 
a little bit more robust but toward the base, more of a uh, sharper angle on it. And it also can have red and purple on it. And this one you can see is a very weak of, of uh, a purple band going around the edge of the petal. And it has uh, yellow and red nectaries at the base of it. But you can really tell this one apart pretty easily. If you may not be able to see it in that picture too well. But the hairs have a very distinctive club shape on it. So it really stands out. You're not going to mistake Calicordus concolor and Clavatus if you had the two next to each other. Of course, the two actually don't look like anywhere near each other, which makes it easy. Oh, I could never picture it. Sorry, Caitlin, I was trying to get all those transitions out. They might not work that well. Here you can see the band on the, uh, uh, the flower is a little sharper in this particular one. Oh, here we go. I did have a little picture showing. You can see the, the, the tips of the petals are a little bit broader than the, the uh, uh, bases of it. And that club shape you find in just a handful of the Mariposa lilies. It's another one that has this sort of very uh, fruit where it's really narrow at the top and broad at the base. You can see it's habitat bound below here. One of the after one of the post one of the fires in the Santa Clarita area, and it grows all over the slopes. And you find it from basically Los Angeles County north into Central California. It's a little bit more confusing than some of the other ones because not only does it look similar to some of the other yellow mariposa lilies, it has three varieties that aren't always very clearly separated. In fact, Andy Sanders at UC, Irv UC Riverside would tell you he doesn't think there are very variations in this particular one. He thinks they're being a little we're, we're picking things apart too too much. Part of the reason he says that because there's a couple places where at least two of these varieties seem to be growing together all the time and mixing to some degree. So the three we've got are the club hair mariposa lily, which is the more common of the of the three, uh, clavatus clavatus. Then we've got slender mariposa lily, which is actually on the CMPS rare plant list, and it's pretty much that's the southernmost one occurring from. Uh, uh, well, I guess maybe it just occurs in Los Angeles County, mostly along the San Gabriel Mountain Durian and the Santa Monica Mountains. And the pale club uh, here, Mariposa Lily, is, extends all the way up almost to the Bay Area. This is an example of, of how you separate a couple of the varieties in this. And it's pretty straightforward in this here. We've got a fairly robust plant on the left. This is the club here, Mariposa Lily, and it has a zigzag to the stem. And then we've got slender Mariposa Lily, the, the one that's actually, like, actually, it's the other. I guess they're both rare plants under CMPS. One is a, a, a four, a rank four, and the other one, the uh, slender mariposa lily is a rank one B. So of course, consultants are trying to really get the one on the, on the right down. And that kind of narrow little nice skinny pattern, it looks pretty clear in here that you could separate these two. The problem is in parts of Santa Clarita area, these two mix in the same populations and they seem to kind of grade into one another. And it's really hard to separate come apart and usually what happens is people just map the whole hills and say the whole thing is Calcoris clavatus, they're both there and then they kind of leave it at that. But uh, at one point I got called up by the Forest Service to go take a look at these and their consultants at the front of the area have been reporting one of these were for the other and they wanted to know what I was thinking about it. And it was the first time I'd actually had an opportunity to see them both growing at the same time. It is a little confusing to have, yeah, because normally we like to have our, our different varieties or subspecies at least growing on different hillsides. Yeah, yet another yellow one with red on it. This is the yellow mariposa lily, Calcortis luteus. It's just barely a Southern California plant. There's some populations out on, on Santa Cruz Island, and there's a old, couple old records for uh, right above Santa Barbara. It's a little hard to pin down exactly where they are. The location is a, is a, as a ranch that I can't seem to find any kind of current name for. So Somebody had something, but I don't think anybody's picked it up in, in they say, in his mountains in the last 50 years or so. So hard to say, but uh, the primary ways of separating this one have to do with the way the, the, the uh, uh, nectaries are, are laid out in it. And the other thing was we don't have club-shaped hairs on this. This was a frustrating plant when I was trying to draw one of these for the Southern California, for the Lily book I was working on. I could not find one of them in Southern California. My life depended on it. And although I spent a lot of time on Santa Cruz Island when I was at UC Santa Barbara, I have not managed to get out there since. So it was a hard one to deal with. So I just drove all the way up to Central California to go find this thing. Actually, it was a lot of fun having a trip up to Central California looking for Southern California lilies. 
So that takes care of that group. That was the biggest one. Now we're going to drop back down in size a little bit. And um, uh, we'll get to one of probably my favorite group of the uh, mariposa lilies, not just because the name section cyclobothra sounds like it came out of some sort of Japanese Godzilla movie. Maybe they did that. Did but it's actually got some really interesting characters in this particular group. One of is that it's got fairly large bulbs and they're fibrous, they've got sort of a fibrous coating, whereas the other mariposa lilies have a, uh, a smooth coating. This one's got a fibrous one. They all tend to be fairly late blooming uh, plants too. The calcores that bloom, that bloom latest in the years are pretty much in this group. The first one we'll take a look at here is late flowered mariposa lily. This, for any of you who have been seeing Calcordus up in Santa Barbara County and San Andreas Mountains, this is one of the ones you're, you're most likely to run into. It is basically a San Andreas uh, mountain planet. There's a, um, a disjunct population that occurs up in the Santa Lucia Mountains in Monterey County, but for the most part, most of the plants are down in, in your area. What's interesting about it is the, uh, when I started looking into it, this is a plant that's on the California Plant Society list as a rare plant, so 1B. But it's always hard to tell when you look at records sometimes, and they all look like they're old. I think there was only like three records or four records uh, when I was looking at this plant that were post-1980. Does that mean this plant was, was really declining or nobody had been looking for it? Actually, it turned out nobody had really been looking for it as much and nobody had been collecting it. it. Turned out it was plenty common, but it's another thing following a fire. So if you get to an area before it's burned, you may only find a handful of plants where there may be thousands if you get to an area after it's burned. So there are a couple of characteristics on late flower mariposa lily. It's usually got sort of a straw colored background matrix color to it. Usually has some sort of purplish or reddish blotches on it. And it's got uh, what they call sort of a double fringe at the edge of the petal, very dark hairs, and if you look particularly at the picture on the, the left, you can see that it's got a, a big tuft of hairs growing right in the center of the petal. The sepals are, are pretty long and narrow, which is something more characteristic of the of, uh, Calcordus obispoensis in the next county north. And uh, it is late flowering. I don't think I've seen this plant blooming before about July 1st or so. And so it blooms all the way into August and sometimes into September. That's pretty late for a mariposa lily, particularly one that's not occurring at high elevations. Like Calcordus and Venustus, the uh, shy mariposa lily can actually bloom most of the summer also, but it's in the San Bernardino Mountains. Basically, spring doesn't really start until April, late April or May sometimes. So it's no wonder we get summer rainfall there. So this one tends to live in areas that are very hot too. The San Ynez Mountains can get very hot in the summer. And apparently it's, it's happier the hotter it is. Like here's our map showing where it is got a very, very narrow distribution in Southern California. And that's almost half its global distribution right there. Typical habitat, chaparral, coastal sage, uh, roadside banks. If you go drive along Camino Cielo Road in July, you're almost certain to see this plant. Now this also one that's a little obscure. At one point, this plant was lumped in with Calcordus weedii, weeds mariposa lily and it was called Calcordus weedii variation vestas. And the keys were not written up as well as they could have in uh, books like uh, Buns, for example. One of the characters they used to separate vestas from the, uh, far, the uh, weedii from the south had to do with the, whether the anthers were pointed or not. When I started really looking at this particular group of plants, I discovered what happens is the anthers change shape between the, the juvenile anthers and the mature anthers. So what's happened is it depends on a lot of what time of the uh, uh, bloom you actually saw this feature. And so we were having records down in Orange Canyon Riverside associated with the plant, but now it doesn't actually occur that far south. It just barely gets into Los Angeles County. Um, like for example, along uh, Squaw Flats Road, I forgot the name of it now, going up in the Sespe, uh Wilderness area. It's a nice place to see this. Doe Flats Road, maybe that's it I'm thinking of there. There you go. It's one disadvantage Zoom. Usually when I lose some track of something, somebody in the audience goes, oh, that's, <laughs> it's a little bit quieter when we do it this way. 
But like um, Calcordus venustus, this particular one can also have a very broad color pattern to it. Although the basic color we see is essentially this sort of um, straw color, it can vary. It can be almost whitish. It can be darker. You can see just a little bit of, of red splotches or a lot of red splotches. So it can be a very dramatic uh, <clears throat> plant sometimes when you're driving along the road and really looking at these things. And here's a few more, even more dramatic color variations on it. Here's one that's got sort of the hairs are sort of rusty orange. And that one actually looks, that's looking, starting to look a lot more like um, Calcordus obispoensis up in San Luis Obispo County. And I found there's some really extreme colors. These were really rare. I mean, basically after a whole day, taking 200 and some odd pictures of plants, probably counting a couple thousand plants, one yellow, one pale yellow one, and one sort of wine uh, red colored flower. So these are really rare forms, but they're very pretty, particularly if you've been seeing the straw colored ones all day. Here's Plummer's Mariposa lily. This is farther south. This is basically from Ventura County South into uh, uh, Orange County and Riverside County. And it's kind of interesting that for years and years, uh, the going thought was that it's basically sort of this sort of purplish magenta color is pretty characteristic of this. The thing you're really supposed to look at is notice that the edges of the petals don't have any hairs on it. The interior side of the petals got a lot of hairs running up about half to two thirds the from the base of the petal, the nice yellow hairs. But the fringe, there is, a, a, there is no actual hairs along the edge of the petals. Another plant that's a sort of a foothill thing, uh, this is the one that blooms earliest of all of them. You can actually find it blooming in April, but more than likely you're gonna find it blooming in May, June, and then starts fading out in July. This particular color plant came from a, a post-fire situation above the uh, Cal State San Bernardino campus. Uh, another plant where you just get tons of them when you have a burn, but you only have few uh, before the fire. Here's our distribution for it. For years, this plant had been considered a CMPS 1B and later CRPR rank 1B plant, but recently they've actually downgraded it to a four. Uh, even though the, its range remains somewhat restricted, there are just thousands of plants where it occurs and it's growing in habitats that are largely not going to be developed. <clears throat> a little bit fatter fruit on it, you can still see that basic linear sex uh, pattern to it where it's, it's um, uh, tapered at both ends. And there's some pretty typical habitat for it down below, basically growing in chaparral and coastal sage grub. And it, if it's not burned, you just find a few of them in the openings. If it's burned, you can see a whole slope full of them. Fred, I just want to let you know we have 10 minutes until 6 p.m. And we were hoping to do some Q&A. Maybe people can stay a little bit afterwards, but uh, just wanted to let you know. Okay, so speed up a little, you're saying. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been notorious for, for talking a little longer than, than, than shorter, so sure. I'll try to keep it. So again, just showing you, here's just some variations in the color of Plumber's Mariposa Lily, mostly from uh, Riverside, pale, uh, sort of pinkish, almost white, and then here's an actual pink plant. For some reason, once in a while, oh, there we go. So the, uh, down in San Diego County, weeds mariposa lily, uh, Calcordus weedii, uh, is basically a really bold uh, golden yellow colored plant. Uh, so you can separate it from the Calcordus concolor in the area because this one has hairs around the fringes of the petals and hairs up and down the, the face of it. It's kind of hard to see in this photograph, but yeah, you can actually see that there are hairs along the edge of this thing. This is that whole uh, species of Calcordus weedii. Basically, there's three different varieties to it. Uh, the intermediates in the north, weeds in the middle, and then Baja California, a little into San Diego, Peninsula Mariposa. Typical habitat, uh, chaparral or, or falling burns. Here's a little bit of the variation in color on this one. Again, everything has a sort of a bold golden yellow base, but you get all kinds of things. Uh, Windy eye is an interesting plant. Early in the season, it tends to have less markings. Later in the season, flowers can be darker, and that's really true with intermediates. Here's the Baja California one. It just gets up into San Diego County. Basically, it's just plain old yellow, and it's often pale. 
Except for in San Diego County, it's, it's not. And of the three weedy eyes, it's the only one that doesn't have hairs along the edge of the petals, as you can see in this photograph. And it's one of my personal favorites is intermediate mariposa lily. And this one has got some of the greatest color variation of any lily in California. That's the main identification characters. It's got uh, fringing hairs along the, the hairs along the edges of the petals and lots of hairs on the face. But uh, sort of a, almost a lemon green, uh, lemon greenish sort of uh, background color, but lots of different colors of blotches and such. Here's some variation on this. I had an opportunity in Orange County to, to run into thousands of these plants, probably took pictures of hundreds of them because they were just so dramatic. And if you were doing stuff in the 1990s, the plant on the upper left would have been, or the upper right would have been called Calcortis plumeri because everybody was just thinking it goes by color. There's some more variation on that. And uh, this is just showing an interesting, uh, uh, how that you get sort of a, uh, I should flip that over there. The variation in the edge of the petal there, you can see the hairs in Irvine Ranch where it's actually Calcutus weedii, has hair, it's hairs all along the edge, but on the, on the left, it's Calcutus plumeri, and it does not. And this one just pointing out, sometimes we have our species a little bit, uh, a little bit ambiguous why we call something a species is not because plumeri and Calcortis weedii pincellaris, except for the fact that one's yellow and, and one's sort of this pink color, they share a lot of characters that are very similar. And if you make them black and white, they don't look very different at all. It suggests either plumeri should probably be a, a, a variety of weedii or the pincellaris. It should be also considered its own species. And we've got one final Calicordus to talk about. This is about the time I thought I had the last of my illustrations done for, for this project I'm working on. Somebody came along and named a new one. It was kind of an obscure thing. Uh, uh, Callaghan, Callaghan, Frank Callahan is it, found this thing up in the, uh, uh, in Placerita Canyon and brought some home and bloomed it and decided it had to be an entirely new species to science. And we've spent a lot of time hunting this down and we've not yet been able to find it. Oops, where's my, oh, sorry. Oops, let me go back for a second there. There's still a fade hitting this thing here someplace. Okay, there we go. Anyway, it's a spectacular flower. And for after not being able to find it for years, we're beginning to wonder if it actually existed or somebody mis had a mistake with Calcortis fimbriatus. Um, but it really looks different. I'm pretty sure it's a real species. We just only have one or two representatives for it. So a couple little dots up in Ventura, Los Angeles County. And there's the type locality. It was found, of course, immediately after a fire. And so I'll, I'll finish up on that then. Just um, uh, say this is, again, a, a pretty spectacular uh, group of plants. And anybody who's on a hike, it's usually one of their favorite flowers. So uh, I'll just leave it like that since we're running out of time. I just wanted to point out briefly for anybody who's interested and doesn't aware about it, I actually do have t-shirts that I sell that have Calcortis art on them. Uh, there's the Northern California and desert version I've got. And, you're doing the Southern California one. And there's a web address there that uh, people can reach if they're interested in, in buying something. And I believe that's it. Great, thank you so much, Fred. I am going to unmute everyone right now. So everyone is can unmute themselves. I think that's the deal. But um, if we could all give Fred a round of applause and- Yay! Um, and I think there's an, just enough of us where we can kind of do a first come first serve. If anyone has a question, just unmute yourself and, and go for it. Yeah, but anybody who's thinking that you're seeing my face when you're addressing it, it's somebody else who's controlling my shirt. Oh, there, never mind. There it is. That's what No, right. I'm going to do it. Someone else shut it yeah, off for me, and I'm out. <laughs> okay. Fred, your camera is off. I'm not sure if you wanted it. Um, somebody else is controlling that. I can't control that. Oh, okay. Well, I get a note saying, unable to start video. Because someone, the host has stopped it. Hmm. Okay. Oh, here we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Didn't think that was in here. Great.
All right. Wow, that's, that was awesome. Really excited to go look for more of those. It's, yeah, it's interesting how I never had noticed, I don't know if I've seen any before with the hairs right on the, the edge of the petal. That's really, those are really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just go up in the sandwich, huh? just go up in the, the mountain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll definitely be looking for that late flower one. That is so beautiful. Does anyone have any questions for Fred? I do. Okay. Sure, Rory. Uh, yes. Is it the, the the proliferation after fires? Is that mainly because of opening up to sunlight and removing competition, or is there something in the heat that triggers the uh, germination more? It's actually pretty widespread in uh, in uh, uh, perennials and annuals in California that when you open up the habitat, there's two things that happen. One, you're you're allowing light to hit the ground that hadn't been hitting it for a while. It's always shaded or something. So in some cases, it's a combination of heat and light. And also following the fire, there's a, a, a spike in nutrients on the ground. So oh, nice. all those things come to play. And you'll find it in many groups of plants where uh, some species you won't see at all. Some of the local weeds, for example, you only see them after a burn. And, and uh, the difference is with Calicornis, the Mariposa lilies, is you often only see a few plants around after a burn. But it's often stunning to see that literally we go from places where like an intermediate Mariposa lily, we typically have 75 plants pretty consistently in a spot, burns, and now we've got 4,000 of them. Wow. Yeah. So cool. So, does, so that means their bulbs are just just waiting, around, dormant. They're all they're waiting, and sometimes they can wait for many years. Yeah. Uh, by the way, this is also true with an area gets covered with, say, exotic grasses or other weeds like um, thistles and such. You clear all those weeds out. Sometimes the year after that, you get this impressive native plant display. It's kind of very similar to a fire in that perspective. That's opening up the habitat competition to some degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the other interesting thing about that is that that first year after the fire is critical, you'll see these huge numbers. The second year, the numbers sometimes fall as much as 80% mm -hmm. in one year. Mm -hmm. yeah. I do a lot of post-fire rare plant surveys, so I get a lot of Calcortis introductions that way. Do you have any idea what the function is of the hairs on the flowers? I shouldn't know the answer to that, actually. <laughs> it might have, you know, when you get hairs on plants a lot, there's a couple different things that happen. One of them sometimes is an environmental thing, like on leaves, the hairs actually cut down um, wind circulation immediately around the flower and allow uh, less moisture, you know, more moisture retention. But I don't think in flowers, that's what we're seeing. It's probably has something to do with, with the pollination of the flower at a, attempt to sort of navigate the insect in direction or not. Hmm. I have to go look that up. I'm not actually a morphologist, so a lot of times I, I can see a kind of pretty flower, and I don't necessarily know why it's doing what it's doing, but I can tell it looks different anyway. That's the first time maybe he's asked me what the, what the, you know, I would say as a guy who identifies it, say the reason the hairs are there so I can tell what species it is. <laughs> I don't think that's how the, why the hairs are there though. <laughs> Got any other questions? So between fires, the uh, uh, maintenance of the Mariposa lily is mostly through bulbs or is it through seed bank or is it both? It's mostly bulbs. Um, there's, it's mixed, it depends on the species. Some of them are pretty prolific reseeders and others are not. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's often kind of a mixture too, but I believe that most of what you're seeing are bulbs because what happens with the seed ones, if they come up, after a fire or something, it's gonna be two or three years sometimes before you actually see anything, so you won't even notice them. So when you're seeing this carpet of, of flowers, they're all coming from recent bulbs. Now in some species like um, uh, Calicordus invenusus, shy mariposa lily, the butterfly mariposa lily, they also have bulblets at the base of the plant. Those bulblets are essentially like little bulbs. They get bigger after a year or two, they actually develop their own plant. They get a head start. So those plants have a double uh, reproductive mechanism. One is you cast seeds out 
and those seeds might germinate. The other one is you get these bulbs out and they have a much higher chance of survival and they're also gonna mature much faster. So, you know, sort of a combination of two. But a lot of it is, it's sort of surprising. Sometimes you get places where clearly this thing hasn't bloomed in 10 years and it's blooming great after something happens with rain or something. Fred, have you had much luck trying to reestablish uh, those, uh, you know, or establish uh, populations from seed, or is it mostly uh, the bulbs that you found to be successful? Are you talking about like if someone's trying to restore habitat or something? Yeah, restoring habitat, or even just trying to transplant them into your garden? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not sure. I haven't had a whole luck with seeds here. I'm I'm more likely to find luck with bulbs. I know there's, for example, Tello's rare bulbs which is in uh, Central California, they sell, they sometimes sell some of the native uh, Mariposa lilies. That's where I usually would try to get them uh, for the most part. I try not to bring them home for a while very much. Yeah. I did virtually every one I illustrated, I took one home and that's, you probably got planted in my garden afterward. But uh, uh, I'm not too good with the, the green thing, thumb thing, so I can't tell you as well about which is gonna grow. I'm one of those guys who presses them between paper and it does a really good job, but trying to grow them is, is tougher. I usually end up with calipers growing for a couple of years in, the, the, in my clay garden. By the way, can't be. <laughs> She's sort of hogging the spot there. Yeah. She was trying to, in the middle of the program, she was trying to slip out the back door. She's figured out how to open all our screen doors and windows too. She's that kind of cat. Anyway, all right. So. So I know that they're probably easier to grow from bulb. If you go to like Theodore Payne Nursery and stuff, they usually sell you the bulb, not the seeds. I think they're kind of challenging to grow though in a in a cultivated garden because it's they're they're so dry, such you know used to such dry conditions. It, it typically, that's the problem with a lot of the natives is you, they really don't want you to have any summer water or very little. And these guys, the bulb ones, really don't want it. I have a section in my front yard that doesn't get any summer water. And I've actually had some pretty good luck with heavy clay and getting things to come up. Mostly Brodea, not um, mm -hmm. uh, Calicordus. I got one, cal one Brodea full of folia thing that I could draw the, the corm on that, planted it. Now I've got 900 plants in the yard. It's a weed. If they can't <laughs> grow it for restoration areas, they have a hard time. I don't know why. Because I don't do anything that grows like crazy. But I uh, don't have that luck with Calicordus. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay, well, if there are no other questions, um, then I guess we can wrap up for the night. Thank you so much for doing this talk, Fred. We really appreciate it. This was yeah, voluntary. Uh, Fred just did it voluntarily for us. So thank you so much. Very much. All right. Well, thank you for inviting me. It would have been more fun to do it in person, but I guess this is yeah. living. This kind of works. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great learning experience. And uh, I'm sure a couple of us will be looking into those t-shirts. <laughs> we see the, we see those around um, our staff mostly. Have those. Yeah. <laughs> People have bought them at Southern California botanist events probably. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. Have a great Enjoy rest of your weekend. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>